Coming up tonight on Game All Night, I'm joined by Matt Morgan. This Week and Each Week is brought to you by Game Toppers. Upgrade your gaming experience. Welcome to Game All Night. Well, hello and welcome to another Game All Night. I will be joined shortly by Mr. Matt Morgan, who um, is notoriously hard to find pictures on the internet of, apparently, for some reason. But I do have Dan here momentarily. Dan, are, you actually poured us some beer here. What do we got? I'm trying, to, I'm trying to actually earn my keep as a bartender up here. I think so, you're doing uh, well. Thank you. So what did I pour for you? I poured a dogfish head namaste white uh so that's a belgian wit from uh from dogfish head so it's a nice it's coming in under five abv it'll have a little bit of like a coriander flavor going on um i don't think it's right up your usual alley but i hope you're enjoying it no i like it on a nice warm day and uh you know it makes me kind of feel guilty that i skipped my yoga practice this morning <laughs> what can I, I think say? i think it's yoga optional this this counts oh, this gets it? your this gets your like daily meditation in without having to actually you know bend you know, there, there's a local brewery, I think Free Will, I forget who else it might be. Um, they actually do beer and yoga, and I'm like, you might have me on that one. <laughs> you might. What are you drinking then? So, and I've poured myself a, a, a Troganator from Trogues Brewing. Now, that's a, a fairly local Reading area brewery, um, and this is one of their, like, longtime flagships from Trogues. So, this is a Doppelbach um uh, strong German you know, I got myself uh, crank the ABV a little bit above your uh, your little session drink that you've got going so. sorry right. you know I have, I have to be on top of my game what can I say and, and <laughs> the the new brewery that's located right next to Hershey Park almost is absolutely gorgeous I highly recommend dropping in and uh, picking stuff up but uh, and I, I'm sure Matt's drinking something Matt are you drinking anything uh, oh hey guess what I should also let the people know I actually have Matt in studio today. I'm almost done drinking something. <laughs> Dan, you'll have to refresh my memory what I'm consuming here. Sure enough, that's my job. Uh, so that's the uh, the Weyerbacher Merry Monks. Um, Weyerbacher for years has done like a strong Belgian golden uh, called, um, called Merry Monks. This is actually the Mellow Monks, now that I think about it. This is their uh, like Belgian blonde, a, a more session ale version of their, uh, their Belgian strong ale. So... Uh, a fine choice, Dan. I'm glad you're doing it. <laughs> Obviously, it's going down. These are all going down very easily. And, and I'll have you know, we haven't spent a lot of time in the green room here. They've just been easy to drink. It is so. about five minutes. <laughs> so, well, thank you, Matt, for driving Thanks in. Thanks for having me. I know, this is this a beautiful is... setup here. Oh, well, thank you. Who's the second guest? Um, Who's going to be coming halfway through the show, right? Leah Thompson said she'd over. be by later. Yeah. Excellent. And we're going to have a comedian, and I may or may not invite him to sit in the chair. You know, we're going to... Does Dan have any musical talents for about halfway through the show? I don't think so. Mm, no. You absolutely Spoons don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> With enough drinking, it might happen, but no one no one wants that. All right. <laughs> it's funny. I actually, uh, when I when I was hunting for Dan to, to co-host, uh, I've been looking for a side, like a in-studio sidekick kind of person. And, you know... There was another guy I was looking at as a friend of mine, Greg, who is a musician and actually like he plays like the local Wegmans and little, okay. little, little like, you know, kind of drop in things. And, you know, I was like, oh, that'd be kind of interesting to have a musician on the show. So, I mean, it could happen at a future time. We'll I see. look forward to it. He doesn't game quite so much as Dan does. So, you know, unfortunately, that kind of kind of helps it's when so you're talking. Rated. Gaming, I think. Anyway. Who has time to do it? Exactly. <laughs> I game less now that I talk about it than I ever did when I did. Tell me about it. <laughs> well, I mean, so tell people about yourself because you kind of, what was funny was, um, you know, the infamous questionnaire that I send around to everybody before show. Um, you kind of actually wrote, I, I had to write down the quote, like, board gaming is probably too new to actually remember my role in it. I think was the way you actually put it. And then um, you check out, like, you know, you've been blogging since 2007. So, yeah, that I, I started in 2012. 
so it's kind of like, yeah, you were you were talking about it before it was cool and hip. You were the original hipster. I, I don't think of myself as old person <laughs> of the board game hobby, but uh, I mean, I guess there is some truth to that. I've bounced around a lot, a lot of different roles, writing right. for different websites here and there, you know, working at this convention or that convention. Uh, Just so you know, when he says a few websites, um, we're talking about MTV and Wired. So we're talking about like real legit mainstream writing here not just like you yeah know, joe's blog that has a couple people on it. i i actually had a paid writing gig yep uh ran that for a good three three and a half years wow. before i you know fully fully burnt out on writing as a job the old axiom of <laughs> you know turn your hobby into a job is a great way to kill it yep uh there was definitely a point in my life where i was up at 2 a.m. writing a board game review before going in for a full-time job. And I said, what the heck am I doing? I'm trying to crank out posts for, oh. you know, a couple pennies here and there. Now, were you doing, like, um, full-on game reviews? And you were doing things like that, right? You were sent yeah. copies, did reviews, playthroughs, mm -hmm. and everything like that. During that, that three, three-and-a-half-year stretch with MTV, I would write uh, roughly five to seven posts a week. Okay. And I would do a Friday review. So I was re reviewing one game a week uh, for a very long stretch there. Wow. So, and it, it sort of bounced around what I was yeah. writing about. I would do anything from, you know, very long form journalism and interviews, you know, deep dive, tell a story, okay. to I'm just going to summarize a press release. Because, <laughs> you know, the honest truth about, uh, you know, the bigger corporate writing job was they pay by the post. They don't really care so much about the content they yeah, just need views and exactly. filler at that point in time mtv had launched a, a big brand that was called mtv geek and they uh. wanted to get their hands in all different aspects of the you know the burgeoning geek market okay and, hey, i was writing for a friend's little blog just because i thought it was fun so i was doing my own board game content you know, very much on the side just for fun for about two years mm. and i wrote to them and said hey i saw you started this brand tabletop gaming is getting popular you know, it's a, a true no matter when you say it and uh, i said do you want someone that would write about board games I said sure uh, and we talked and negotiated a rate and said like yeah we'll pay you by the post and you just write whatever you want about tabletop gaming industry we'd love to have that as one corner of our website uh, so i i took that on as like Great power, great responsibility. I was, I was trying to cover <laughs> the ambassador. everything right. under the sun from like wargaming to Magic the Gathering and everything in between. So I probably put too much on myself to try to become an expert and cover everything. Interesting. And, you know, that's why I only lasted a few years. Well, I mean, anybody who's done any kind of content creation for any amount of time realizes rapidly how draining it can be because... Mm -hmm. You start out and you have this huge, huge amount of repertoire. You know, think of it as, um, you know, when a band first gets discovered in that first album, yeah. right? They've had how many years to work on that first album? Like, so I have all this experience gaming that I can draw on. And then all of a sudden you realize after X amount of time, or in the case of an album, one album, you're like, oh, wow. Do it now again. Now we have to start over. <laughs> and now you have to do it in less time and with yeah. less time things backing it up so yeah you, that well gets depleted kind of quickly i can imagine you know now how much during this time because you know I've, we've had reviewers on and they'll put out a podcast every other week and stuff like that and they'll talk about maybe a game or a few they're playing and first impressions but like how much are you actually getting to play if you're trying to get all this writing done at the same time it seems like that had to be like not as much as you would have liked i was also at a, a point in my life where you know i was, hadn't started a family yet right i just probably gotten married around that time uh, so i had a bit more free time i was going to a couple of game nights you know i had a wednesday night group a weekend group so i was able to get a fair bit okay. of plays in but i did fall into that reviewer trap of you know you're always trying to play the next thing that came in the mail, that sort of thing. So you either have to teach people, you have to have a steady play group, or, you know, and one that'll accept learning a new game every yeah. single time they sit down. Not a lot of time to revisit the classics. Yeah, because you, you kind of miss deep diving on something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. So did you, did anything like surprise you on the back end when you left and you kind of, 
I wouldn't say re-entered the hobby, but you actually became a hobbyist on the back side of that and you kind of came out the other end. Is there anything that kind of jumped out at you and said, wow, this is, this is so much different or better? I'd say the thing that surprised me the most was that the quality of games and game production has just continued to increase. Because okay. when I was covering the industry on a day-to-day -day basis, it seemed, you know, 2010 to 2013, can't get better than this. <laughs> We're at the peak of society. It's the best year here. ever. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the number of games published every year has continued to go up. The quality of the you know, graphic design and the production right. values, the components has continued to go up. Uh, I think it's very easy to look at games and say, there's too many of them. Why are people continuing to buy right. the new thing? But it all rests upon this one assumption, which is, there's always someone new entering the hobby. So right. There's always a, a better slate of games than there was yesterday available to them today. Yeah. It, and you know what? I, I totally agree because, you know, we kind of had that talk about, you know, who's buying the new games because, you know, as somebody who's been in for, you know, six years now, I'm kind of my purchasing slowed down because I'm looking for replacements or something that improves mm -hmm. on something in some way. Um, and it, it makes it harder to get in, but you're right. Somebody new jumping in is benefiting and getting all these beautiful components and these beautiful games. And they don't remember how hard it was when we were kids. And <laughs> I mean, and, there, and there's another side of the coin to that as well. I don't say that things are getting better by the day and that everyone right. should go out and buy new stuff. <laughs> I mean, I'm in a position where I buy almost nothing new. I, I sort of want to curate a well-rounded collection and kind of call it a day and right. say, you know, I'm out. You know, just because a game may be 2% better in this one area, I may have found that one game that already sort of scratches that itch. Okay. And I want to go deep on that rather than always constantly yeah. chasing something new. Definitely makes sense. You know, I, um, I always, and it's ultimately why we avoid the review trap here. It's just, you know... We'll, we'll talk about games, we'll play them, we'll have fun, and we're finding, you know, success just enjoying that. And I think that, you know, showing off a game or two, I think, is just as important as reviewing it. Because, yes, definitely. Uh, cool. There's much more to talk about than just a narrow look at the overall quality right. of the game. Right. One of the things that's happened a lot in the last couple of years, well, I mean, I guess it's been going on for... for uh, five years at least is you know it's similar sets of mechanics that are streamlined more like you know every time they re uh issue a game i feel like the, the thing they work hard on is streamlining it for new gamers um and you know i'm old and curmudgeonly enough that that you know, I, <laughs> I tend to prefer like, like i tend to to recoil from streamlined i tend to prefer the stuff that has its warts on it and, and has those little little road bumps that uh i think that's part of the character of the experience so so like the um a study in emerald might be one that kind of <laughs> there's that has some warts I mean, the, <laughs> the perfect example of this is something yeah like, where we are right now you know late 2018 where we just had yellow and yangtze drop which right. is the you know in sequel inspired uh, version of tigers and euphrates okay uh, which is probably one of if not the best game of all time in my but opinion also one of the most convoluted and complicated scoring games yes. to try and figure out you so can trip over yourself very easily as buried a new player. entry is very hard so it's an interesting problem does one of the greats require a sequel mm. and the answer is after having played it only one time so far i'd say actually yes they did a very good job of changing up the formula okay. doing the streamlining and now i'm feeling that itch of you know, is there a place on a small curated collection shelf for both? You know, do they both serve a specific purpose? Right. Is one an on-ramp to the other? Is there a sort of graduated experience yeah. there? Yeah, because when, you, when you're right, when you hit that thing where you're curating a collection, you know, if you're the Omni Gamer, it's your nightmare because you want one of everything. But if you're focused and hyper focused on like war games or coin games, you know, yeah, it's very easy to kind of say like, well, I'll keep five coin games of, of the eight, nine available. Mm -hmm. That's easy to say, you know, but if I want one area control game, it's like, do I just buy El Grande and call it a day or do I worry about Kemet and, you know, all these other things? Yeah, so how much time are you going to spend racking your brain trying to say what is the best? 
Yeah. And but you know, I think ultimately the best one is the one that you get played. Absolutely. Right? Because a game sitting on your shelf gathering dust can be the best game ever, but if it never makes it out, it's not adding to your joy. I would definitely right. encourage people to go out and look at releases, not from right now, even though they may be getting better by the day. Right. Look t even just two to three years back into history and figure out what has held up up to this point in time. Yeah. I go back to that 2007 to 2010 area where I was sort of on my on-ramp into the hobby. The big reason I thought people were getting into board games at that time was like recoiling from what was happening in video games. Okay. You were getting into situations where, you know, this was the first time DLC was becoming a big thing. Okay. And people were worried, you know, it, are there going to be, you know, the cash grab type DLC? Sure. Things that wouldn't have been in the game if we couldn't have squeezed an extra ten dollars out of that player's <laughs> wallet. Um, the price of entry is yeah, dropping, but exactly. we're killing you on the back end. So people start to desire an experience where everything comes in the box. I get the complete experience, and it's going to hold up for a very long time. This same game will still be great and valid 40 years from now, and you're right. not going to get anyone at your table who's going to say, oh, I don't want to play that old game. Like, say, maybe some of your video game buddies might say, oh, we're not going to go play an old GameCube game right now, even though I love that stuff. Oh, yeah. Because it might not happen. That's where my Ratchet and Clank lived. <laughs> exactly. So it, when you start to see games these days, these are the warning signs I try to point out. You know, Don't jump in headfirst into games that are pumping out expansions one after another. You know, Look at something that has had its complete package produced, You know, the complete game experience, Stood the test of time. Everyone still loves it two or three years later. Jump in on that stuff and yeah. build your collection around it. It's funny. I would I would say if you go back and look, especially since you know starting the show, my game this takes up a big chunk of my game time. Mm -hmm. So it's when I go to the game store, I would argue that at least seventy five percent, if not half, of what I buy is expansions for stuff I already own because I know I already love the game, so I'm going to buy the expansion. But I'm not buying as much new stuff because I haven't had time to do my research. I don't have the play group that brings all the new stuff because I was that guy. Um, you know, so I, I don't get that that fresh influx yeah. of stuff as much. It's interesting how it changes for you. And it sounds like you're the perfect market for expansions. You've, yeah. you've developed, you know, your slate of games that you really love and you are going to wear them out. Right. I don't think enough people are doing that. They're not wearing out the games on, the, on their shelves before they go ahead and buy an expansion. Right. So when I see the number of expansions coming out, you know, it doesn't add up. Yeah, and the ones that drive me nuts are the expansions that have to fix something else, right? Like, well, the game should have not needed this expansion. It really should have been included. Well, now I'm paying $80 for a game that really should have been 50 or 60 out of the gate yeah. with this included. And that kind of, that rubs you a little wrong too. And you, you've run into that, I'm I sure. Mean, and people try yeah. to spin the argument I made around to say, well, video games have patches. Yeah. Now, if a game could be improved, should it not be improved? It's hard to argue against that. If you can make a better version, you should do it. Right. But by my own token, what I want is something that is great out of the box. Yeah. And I, I think if we're producing 3,000 plus four games a year, uh, there probably are a handful in there that are just A plus out of the box, just need the sands of time to shift around. We can figure out which ones they actually are. Right. And then like kind of let it go from there. But you are, it's interesting because this is also pretty much the premise of a YouTube show you did a little while ago called Why I Kept It. And, uh, you, you said earlier that you're thinking about starting that back up again and starting to do some of the prelim work on that, but it mm -hmm. sounds like you this is a big chunk of the hobby for you now. It's like justifying, why do I keep this when there's five replacements coming for it? Yeah, I hit a point when I was in that reviewer's seat where the quantity of stuff coming in was just too fast to even yeah. review it, and the collection space was exploding. So... I imposed a rule on myself. It was a space limitation. Right. I had one beautiful IKEA wall, you know, <laughs> the, st the hallmark of the board game hobby. Yes. Put my games up on a wall, take some pictures in front of them. 
and I pledge to myself, I will not exceed the bounds of this wall. Right. So new stuff would come in, I'd get tempted and I'd buy something. At that point, it's a one in, one out situation. Right. And I you think know, that small that... box games are great. Yeah, exactly. And then you have these just like crates of small box games where, you know, you have multiple quivers, yeah. either one, right? Exactly. You know, <laughs> I, I, no one wants to be in a position of, you know, hiding board games in their sock drawer. Yeah. So develop that, that level of protection that you have to put on yourself and say, this, this is going to be the size of my collection. This is what works for me based on how many game groups I have, how big the game groups are, how varied right. their tastes are, how varied my tastes are. All these things, you know, keep yourself awake at night, staring at the ceiling, asking yourself the question, how many board games should I own? And eventually the clouds will part and like a number will just hit you in the forehead. Or, or your wife says, you can't go past the den. That's oh. it. When the pile starts You should have up, a partner who yeah, is they... <laughs> on, on board and a, of equal interest with you or I do, of mutual understanding. But the limit's still there. And it's, um, you know, and I... You've seen, like, it, it creeps in. I have it down here in my game room down here. I have, like, well, these are just the heavy games. And then the upstairs. I'm like, oh, well, these are just the party games. And then I actually have the game room that has the Ikea wall that houses the more hobby neutral games that we have. Yeah. And, but that's it. That's kind of like, no. And, like, now it's like, yeah, there's a pile growing on the floor. That'll be for either an auction or giveaways or something at some point. So Yeah, if you get into the position of you know hiding purchases from your partner, you check yourself into BGG Rehab and yes. call yeah. it a day. Well, that's so true of nice anything. Somewhere. But, you know, my dad used to hide power tools in his trunk of his car when he would... <laughs> He would buy them. In case so. you break down on the road. Yeah, you know, I kind of, that, that's kind of my role model, so. <laughs> but yeah, you mentioned the YouTube show. That is something that will come back. Cool. I announced uh, maybe a month or two ago that I had you know, sort of entered pre-production. All right. In the sense that I'm upgrading my equipment, learning some new software tools, try to improve the overall flow of things. Right. That's one of the reasons why I do it is I really like learning new skills and seeing mm -hmm. how things work so the excitement of figuring out live stream and you know live recorded video production was right. something that excited me yeah it's uh, great i filmed 50 episodes of a season called why i why i kept it uh, all based around telling the story of my collection pull one game off the shelf talk about it for about three minutes ramble and actually take five minutes <laughs> cut it down uh, and I would talk about anything mostly why this game has sort of a permanent spot on my collection right. but tell either a personal story you know why it has sentimental value to me or why it is you know revered piece of board game history that I want to show people right. or just damn great game that's always going to hit the table if any yeah. of those reasons I'll hold it up and tell a story about it so real quick before the break, I got to know, is there ever a tipping point where you have a game sitting on the shelf and you happen to log in BGG and you realize all of a sudden that you have an out of print rare game sitting on your shelf and you could get a hundred plus bucks for this thing you spent 20 or 30 on and you just go, you know what? I love it, but I don't hundred dollars love it. Have you, have you liked, has that been a reason at any point? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there are certain games <laughs> that I will hold on to, right? Regardless of how much they cost. I I went in on that Small World Designers Edition Kickstarter oh, years okay. ago. Uh, they did not know what they were getting into when they produced that thing. I remember them taking a healthy loss on it. Right. I refer to that as my mortgage payment. <laughs> you know, things ever go south, that that thing sells for over a thousand dollars, but it, I'm never moving it. It's the new War of the Ring. Yeah. yeah. And there's a couple games that are probably have some value on my shelf, but I am like completely unabashed, willing to sell things, flip things, buy them back later. Uh, I've kickstarted things and then got them in and realized they were selling for double what I pledged. And I said, well, I already have like 250 games on the shelf. Right, and I'm uh, probably, it's probably not... going to sit there for six months before I get to play it. Right, so it'll be a retail. See you later. Might as well... Yeah, moving on. Exactly. And I, I don't think it's being opportunistic. I think it's just, I look at it as, yeah, it might be expensive, but at the same time, somebody's willing to pay that and they're going to get joy out of it and they want it and it crosses a grail game off their list. I'm happy I'm, to take advantage yeah. of rich people. Yeah. Or there people with very wealthy people out there who want to throw their money around <laughs> and, 
you know, we got to fight tooth and nail for what we got. So rich person, please PayPal me $120 right? yeah. for this $60 game. I sold a few copies. I found, um, I found High Frontier at a local game store um, and they were selling at MSRP and I'm kind of like, I'll buy these <laughs> and I, I flipped them straight away because yeah. it was just like they, they didn't know what they had and I'm like well and what, what did I do I just came back and spent all that money back at that store so they sold two games at 60 bucks I got like a hundred and some for them and then I went back to the store and spent it again so they got even more money out of me so anybody who's crying saying the game store should have got more money I'm like <laughs> oh believe me they got it you did your part <laughs> All right, well, you're low on drink. Oh, I'm fine. about to finish mine. I think this is a great time to take a break. Mr. Bartender, can you cut us out of here so we can get some drinks? Because we'll be right back after this. Pontifications with Patrick Hillier. A hundred years ago, everyone owned a horse and only the rich had cars. And today, everyone has a car and only the rich have horses. Oh, how the stables have turned. Welcome back. He's still on the couch. We still kept him around. Mr. Matt Morgan, uh, we had to refill because we, we tore through those beers. So Dan poured us some, uh, some nice uh, drinks here. I can't even say bourbons because... Uh, we're not all drinking bourbon. It's, no. it's, it's whiskey time. That's, that's, what we're, that's what we're going on. We're going into uh, phase two is, is the whiskey hour. Absolutely. I think there's an old saying in the uh, in the bartender profession that uh, beer before liquor, have fun quicker. So uh, I think is, <laughs> I don't I'm don't pretty think sure that's how, that's how, it, how goes. it goes. <laughs> this is a light colored couch here. <laughs> don't worry. The, uh, the, the outside back door is very close. Excellent. So, so we're in good shape. But... Uh, you, sir, are drinking a gift from uh, the actual first in-studio guest who's yet to air because we haven't finished the second half of his show. Poor, poor person that he is. And that's uh, the Lagavulin 16, which is amazing. What do you think Very of that? Very good. Yeah. What was it? 16 years, smoky, single malt. Yeah. It's an Eli. So it can't it's be space, denied. Space side Eli. It's an Eli. So it's going to be nice and peaty and smoky. But it doesn't taste like I'm eating that's a... Good. It's it's wonderful, and um, so so I I spent all my money on yours because we're drinking the twelve dollars special this week at our state store called the Evan Williams White Label, uh, courtesy of my bourbon and board games uh, compatriot. He he recommended it. And I, you know what? It's what do you think, Dan? I think it's rather drinkable. Yeah, I'm enjoying it a lot, and, and uh, it's not the first time I've heard the the bottled and bond White Label come up as a uh, as a recommendation. Yeah. It's a it's a nice inexpensive bourbon. Yeah, and it drinks really well. I'm so, you know, thanks, Glenn. Good job. Well, cool. So, meanwhile, back in the camp, we had a nice little chat. Um, so, the other hat you wear um, is you run the tabletop gaming section of PAX on the East Coast and South, if I'm not mistaken. PAX East and PAX Unplugged. Okay. Where's East these days? East is up in Boston. Okay. And Unplugged is in Philadelphia. Which, what well, we saw its first year last year. Yep. Um, now, it did, it, it was controversial. It went up against BGG Con, and it's going to crush BGG Con and all that. And uh, that turned out to be a whole, no, that's not what it's about, guys. It's literally the only week the convention center could give us. And that, yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly yeah. it. I mean, we're on good terms with BGG, and we're not on the same weekend this year. Nope. I mean, they sold out. They sold out again. I think really the only people that put a strain on was uh, some, of, like, some mid-sized exhibitors. Right. You know, could they pull off two shows at once? Uh, most of them did. Unfortunately, not yeah. all of them could be at two shows at the same time, but... Well, I mean, it worked BG out for the best of yeah. all, I mean, across the industry. But BGG doesn't strike me as a, it's a vendor show. Like, it doesn't strike me as that. Like, they have the hot games area uh, that they try to bring over some of the Essence stuff for. And they, they really try to kind of play that card. And they have, like, a smaller, they're not trying to be another Origins. Like, that, that doesn't feel yeah. like their bag. It's more about the gameplay and things like that. Even Stephen Bonacore told me, um, when I saw him at WBC one year, he's like, that's my favorite con to go to because I actually get to play games. Well, that was funny when, <laughs> so pe the people would say, says that. <laughs> when people tried to make a controversy out of it last year. 
you know, they're out the same weekend going toe to toe. Right. I would say I'm sad because BGG was my favorite con. I was going to BGG con for yeah. years before Pax Unplugged existed. Uh, so, I mean, I tried to create my favorite aspects of BGG within PAX. I mean, we, we sort of duplicated the hot games room. We call it PAX's first look area. Right. Uh, because I was sad that I couldn't get out there and play all the hot new Essence stuff. But right. as far as, you know, what's the tenor of the conventions, uh, you know, as far as I could tell, in my own personal take, is that about 50% of the people who showed up to PAX Unplugged had never been to any convention before right. like not even a comic no. convention or anything yeah and i i would totally agree and i think that that's due to the uh there's a huge um dearth of board game conventions on the east coast right yeah. location like, I mean, was a huge factor right like i mean you have washington is probably about as close as you get on this side i would say to like a true board game convention and you know it's it's hard and wbc was here but it yeah they, that that doesn't strike me as a board game convention because you know you live locally but you've never been and you assume just like everybody else that it's oh it's it's all about tournaments and you know what i played one in the three years i went literally one tournament in the three years i went so it's more about like the open gaming for me it depends on how you act but I don't think that message got out so I don't think that that really drew people and then there's really not much in New York and Boston you had PAX but PAX has always had the aura of the video right? I'd say uh, Granite Game Summit is one okay, you want to look out I gotta for go to New they are <laughs> big up and coming I mean for New England they're gonna yeah. be the big show after, and Con at Con some point is another one I hear there's tons of good shows right. uh, but they're all the smaller sort of hotel con size you know max right. out at you know, a couple hundred or a couple thousand even. Uh, Kineticon is yeah. sort of an omni convention, you know, anime, sci-fi. Right. It has a very good gaming area. It's sort, it's sort of like a mini PAX. But no one has attempted to create a convention that was of the, the grand scale, you know, try right. to be one of the, the big entries in the convention calendar. So it, it's awesome because it's in both our backyards, obviously. So, you know, got to experience and see if the year one uh, and I'm, I'm really kind of amazed to see what's going to happen this year. So last year we had the first looks area. You brought over a bunch of, you know, games and I think Game Surplus helped you out. Yep. Getting a lot of these games over from, you know, Essen so that we could have them to play. You know, we I think the big deal was like I got Merlin for like, you know, there were 60 copies at, at PAX Unplugged last year. Yeah. That was like the big the big thing you could get is because nobody really knew how to stock it. Nobody knew what to bring because they didn't know. And then Saturday was, I was working at a booth and it was like the busiest day, but it was also one of the slowest because we had so many people just checking it out and seeing what it's about and saying like, oh my God, we have a PAX. And you know, if you're in Philadelphia, I can be in here from Washington on a train in less than two hours. I can be down from Boston and New York City in two hours. I could be on a train and it's like a hop, skip, and a jump, and I'm there. It's it's so close and accessible to so many people. I can't wait. This year's got to be nuts because I it's gonna, yeah, it I, gonna if be. it doesn't double, I would be amazed, like literally. So there will definitely be some doubling <laughs> that is happening. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not at liberty to unveil big plans for what the show is going to be. Uh, right. There's only three months left to go, so there's going to be some big news coming sure. relatively soon. But if you look at all the areas of the show that were at Unplugged, everything is growing by somewhere between 50 and 100% wow. like, across the board. So everything you loved from last year is just going to be there on a grander scale. Right. Anything that was a complaint that people had or issue they have with the con that's all ironed out there's been okay. a lot of work put in the past year so what do you think um because personally i didn't really have complaints um you know i i got to see all the days even set up and break down um because you know again i was with the publisher yeah. so got to see all that and the publishers loved it because they loved how the convention center is the convention center is pro and they just handle it and you just show up and your booth stuff is there and mm -hmm. you go and it's like same thing you call for your load to go and it was out so they loved it on that front um open gaming was great it was huge you had tables marked it was pretty open and obvious i mean in the end i 
when's enough enough, I guess, is the next question, right? Because yeah. it's, it's a lot of space to dedicate. Well, the building's only so big, so at some point you hit yeah. a maximum. Right. I mean, it's just like, well, we can take over a couple floors, but, you know, we're still dealing with the space limitation. So what do you think were some of the complaints that you guys tried to address this year that were different from last year? Uh, probably the toughest part was some of the registration aspects, you know, mm -hmm. RPGs and mega games. Okay. Uh, supply simply couldn't meet demand. Interesting. So you tackle that from two fronts. Uh, the registration procedure will be announced soon. Okay. Uh, and the amount of supply is going to be increased significantly. All right. So everyone's going to be pretty happy. Everyone's going to get a chance to play. Cool. Uh, one of the things I like to describe the experience as uh, the opportunity to come in at, and work packs was a, a really big one. So, you know what? I'll dial it back a few steps. <laughs> Before we dive to, I'll actually dial it back a few steps. And, you know, we left off at the break. Right. You know, I was. Mr. Burnt Out Reviewer. Right. Uh, there was an intermediate portion there where I hopped around and did a couple different things. I, I wrote a newsletter. Okay. I did a few episodes of Board Game Breakfast for Dice Tower. And I was like trying these different things out. Right, and the right. thing I fell back on, sort of as my retirement job from <laughs> writing, like being a board game journalist, was getting involved in conventions. I figured okay. it was a great way to you know, condense all my involvement in the industry, all the contacts I'd built up, everything I'd learned okay. about behind the scenes. I could put that to good use in one weekend a year. There you go. Uh, lo and behold, it has become effectively an all year job, you know, wow. down the road. And my sort of my role there was I became the tabletop manager for PAX East. Okay. Which is, you know, sort of is my local big con. I'm in New Jersey, it's you know a five hour drive. And it was a great experience, get to put a little bit of work in creating uh, that one weekend a year, a great tabletop gaming section within the larger machine that is, you know, what was my favorite brand of convention, the PAX conventions. You go right. for, for video games, concerts, tabletop gaming, everything that I was into, you get a little bit of it in one weekend. Uh, lo and behold, PAX Unplugged was announced sort of right in my backyard here. <laughs> so I stepped into a position where I became the tabletop manager for that show. For a show that is all about tabletop. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the role is not only doubled, now it's even yeah. so three as, times So essentially the, size. the position that I'm in here is I've actually formed my own company. Okay. I have a small one-man event planning services company. I have you know contracts with PAX East, PAX Unplugged. So I don't represent the convention or, or speak for them. Okay. That's why I'm not sort of announcing anything big here. But I'm happy to talk with you and give like my own personal take on sure. you know what it's like to work as a convention planner, my experiences with you know attending and you know helping pull off okay. the, the grand machine that is PAX. But it's, that's what it is. It's all sort of my own personal story right. here. And we'll let we will let PAX and the uh, the powers that be as a whole <laughs> announce all the big stuff and handle that. Well, that you know what? Things. So I think now's a really good time to say if future Matt wants to hop in and kind of give us some some awesome spark of information before this actually drops, we'll uh, we'll wait for him to come on now. Hey, everyone. One thing I didn't get a chance to talk about when I was in the studio with Chris and Dan is the amazing community that PAX has built up over the years to help run these cons. The enforcers, PAX's staff, they are the driving force behind what has made PAX so unique, especially now with Unplugged being a tabletop con. When you look at the schedule and see all the gaming events there, the vast majority of those are not put forth or developed by the exhibitors and publishers. They're internally created and run by that enforcer team. You know, the enforcers here are truly the ones putting on the show for you. Now, the reason I bring all this up is that we've got applications open and if joining up with PAX Unplugged and becoming an enforcer to help run the con sounds like something of interest to you, we'll love to hear from you. You want to steer your web browser to unplugged.paxsite.com slash enforcers. I could have taken up another hour of Chris's show easily uh, if we'd steered the conversation down the path of, you know, why do you enforce, what are your experiences are, those types of things. Uh, but honestly, I'd, I'd rather tell that to you one on one if this is something you've got questions about. I mean, my Twitter DMs are open. I'm always happy to answer people's questions about enforcing. It's personally 
been the most rewarding job I've ever had because I think there's something to be said for stepping outside your comfort zone and tackling different types of jobs that really you don't get to do in your day-to-day -day employment. You've also got a lot of freedom and responsibility put on you right, fr right from day one, which can be a very rewarding experience. I mean, you get to join up with a big crew, work with people from all different walks of life, a great experience, and you all work with that same common goal in mind. You're trying to create the convention that you want to go to, both in the content and the culture. So if this all sounds interesting to you, like I said, hit that link. Uh, it is thought of as a volunteer position. I mean, you should have that I want to volunteer and give back type of mindset, but I do like to say up front that it is fairly compensated. You know, we're not taking advantage of anyone's time here. Uh, that being said, you do have to legally be able to work in the U.S. because it is a paid position. So there's really not many other perks. There's a few small things here and there, but they're just the icing on the cake. Uh, PAX isn't the sort of con where people have, you know, VIP badges and line cutting or early admission privileges. Everyone's on a, a pretty equal playing field there. So if con creating conventions and attending conventions is something you love to do, absolutely want to hear from you and the last thing i'd say here is that it's an opportunity to get in on the ground floor uh, a lot of the year-round community members of the pax enforcers they'll travel to more than one pax each year uh, but i'd say the majority really have their home local show uh, that they work for and try to create so if you're especially from this you know mid-atlantic region here this is only our second year in philadelphia uh, this is potentially something where you could get in early and, and help be one of the members that shapes what PAX Unplugged is going to be for hopefully many, many more successful years to come. All right. Thank you very much again, Chris and Dan, for having me, and thank you all for watching. Well, if that happened, I'm sure it was amazing and very interesting. So. I thank you, future Matt. For, it's gonna be good. I think, yeah. I think if you if you found any nuggets there, I think that that's pretty awesome. So, <laughs> hey, I tell you, it, it's it's a professional operation. You've seen, right? Absolutely. Seen? Absolutely. The so whole so, crew here. So, in the so packs unplugged, I kind of felt that it it had a very similar feel to Origins. Um, maybe it was a few years ago, like in the the vibe of the Accurate. show yeah i think that yeah. that is and i think oh, that almost the same exact size too so it's yeah pretty much i mean there. and philadelphia you know poo poo my city as you will and i will be right there with you you know we're, we're not the best but the location is wonderful because you're right in center city you have a lot of things to do in the town if you've never been and you care at all about history it's great um you know we have writing terminal market which is pretty amazing food and everything right across yeah. the street. So I did so, rolling yeah. dice and taking names last yeah. year, preparing for <laughs> Pax and Pug 2017. Right? I, I threw down the challenge. I said, Reading Terminal Market is, is going to beat the North Market. Ooh. And they said, you are a bold-faced liar. Yeah. And, uh, I, think, I think I won. Well, it's definitely larger because uh, this year was my first Origins. And I like the North Market. I mean, now, A, oh, it's great. Let, let's be honest. Both of them die on Sunday. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fair is fair. Like, don't go Sunday afternoon and expect everything to be open. You will wait an hour for a couple cheesesteaks. That's life. But, you know, it's like, I think that each one of them has some pretty awesome special things to offer. And, yeah. uh, you know, I found a great deli at Origins, but, like, there's, there's just some... Yeah, you know, we get some of the Amish stuff coming into Philly at the Reading Terminal. If, that's just amazing. If we go too deep on food, at oh, Pax that could Unplugged, be a whole other episode. We will get into hour three, and Dan, you will need to refill this fast. I mean, the, not only that, we'll have to order takeout. We'll have to get some Uber Eats up in here. I mean, because. not only is the convention center connected to Reading Terminal Market, it shares a border with Chinatown. Like you just walk yes. over and. And Korea every Town's different type of cuisine is at yep. your fingertips. Yeah, you can go to Center City. You know, a quarter or a half a mile at most, you know, to the southwest, you can get, you know, high food of any different variety. Yeah. We have, we have um, if, if Philadelphia is one thing that I love, it's we have a great food culture here. And Absolutely. it's just, uh, I mean, 
Come on, like when, when it comes to conventions, people, you need to take breaks, you need to go out and you need to eat food. You might as well make sure that it's really good. Jenny's is good, don't get me wrong. I don't think we can compete on that level. That's something special, but uh, you know, everything else, I, I'm right, I, I think you're right. I think, PAX uh, Unplug 2018, you're really coming for the food. Yeah, that's, there you that's, go. That's really all yeah. there is to it. And, and, and to play all the, the Essen games that you know Game yeah. Surplus ships over for you. So Game we, Surplus, fantastic sponsor there. Yeah, they, it's amazing what they do. Um, they, I, I heard Jeff talk about it. Like, was the one year he went over with them, and he's mm -hmm. just like, they're playing like board game Tetris, trying to get all these boxes piled in, stacked together, and to get things oh, yeah. shipped back over. It's just amazing. You know, the act of Essen muling, you know, bringing over a hundred games in your luggage, is uh, an art. Unto itself, you know, breaking <laughs> things down, nesting the boxes together. You know, so, some have even taken to slicing the corners of the boxes and flat packing yes. them. Yes, oh, like there's I could, all di there's different techniques. Everyone's got their style, but the the act of getting games over from Essen is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, one thing to note the dates here, Essen. I think is maybe a week earlier. You have to check me on that. Uh, but Unplugged is two weeks later. So my personal hope here is that it's going to make it a lot easier, not only for okay. people to bring over multiple copies of things for that first look area. That's one of our goals so is be to able not to just ship have, it rather not than just have it, one copy of the hot yeah. game, but to have, say, four right. where people can actually get into a rotation and play their preferred game. Right. But also my hope on the exhibitor front is that with the amount of time in between, uh, I don't, I'm not a master of logistics here. I don't know air freight versus you know, boats coming right. over the water. But if, you know, a month and a half, maybe you can get stock to sell. You can cash in on having those games featured in the first look area and actually be able to, you know, move product to people. Right. Create, you know, the American post Essen show. I, I think that... I think that that's what this can definitely be. I think this can be the American debut of something that kind of comes right behind yeah. the Essen release. And I think that they could really... I think publishers could take note of it. You're in the holiday market too. I mean, Perfect people are ready timing. to open their wallets and buy gifts. You know, everyone's getting Essen games for Christmas. Yeah, I mean, you think about it, and I, you know, it's I haven't, like I said, I've only been in six years. I haven't been in this hobby that long. But even in that amount of time, you know, the time from it being released to Essen to it being available in the U.S. that is shrinking rapidly. In a lot um, of cases, yeah. A lot of times there yeah. are simultaneous releases. It's in store shelves a week after Essen. Yeah, because I think more yeah. partnerships are getting made at a level of production now. It's not just a, let's go to Essen and figure out what we want to buy for our brand and then rebrand it and bring it over. I think a lot of mm -hmm. that's happening before the game is even put out. But it's so not it's, a golden rule, certainly. Oh, by no means. I mean, like I said before the Go break, find I had Fox sort Dobler, of... Go find Von Kilden, exactly. Morgan, Hamburger. I, I had sort of avowed myself, you know, not to look at the cult of the new. I was going to, you know, do my YouTube show and look at my right. wall of classics. As soon as I got into this position, I started having to follow what was coming out at Essen very closely to help pick what was going to go in that area. Right. And that got such rave reviews, this whole concept of doing the hot games or first look area. Right. That we decided to take this stock of games we'd invested in. You know, we're going to PAX South six weeks after Unplugged. And then okay. six weeks after that, we go to PAX East. Why not put a first look area there? So we've, sure. we've created first look area within all of the PAX tabletop shows now. And I've been able to follow the calendar. <laughs> you know, we refresh the slate of you know fifty or so games that we're offering for demo. Okay. And certain games will drop off. And say, oh well, they'll just go in the library because you know they've been on store shelves for two months. It's going to be available. And so. then some games still that we had in first look at unplugged are still there. You know, as we're rec we're actually recording the weekend of PAX West. Right. They're still out there in first look at PAX West because they haven't come over from Germany yet. And people right. still can't get their hands on them. So, yes, things are coming out simultaneously. German, American, European releases at the same time on store shelves. There's still a lot of co-publication deals that are taking a year or longer to okay. get those games properly translated and out to market. Right, yes. Yeah, the, the ones that don't have partnerships are the one-offs. Yeah. Of yeah. Now, 
so you you're obviously you're not Mr. Pax Unplugged. That's not your thing. No, you, I, I am a small piece of the puzzle. So if you were to describe that piece to somebody who'd been to say an Origins or the show previously, what part of that are you directly responsible for? I'd say probably most equivalent to like a uh, scheduled event manager or a staff manager, although I, okay. those are neither of my positions. There are people who run the schedule. Uh, one right. of the things PAX focuses on is panel content. Okay. So a lot of the high production value theater type experiences. Because last year brought the shut up and sit down guys over. Yeah. Thank so you for that. I'm not really involved in that aspect of the show. Mm -hmm. and I help with reviewing them. And I, okay. I run the schedule for a certain subset of our gaming spaces. Okay. So we could talk about we have a, a learn and play room. We have a right. hobby workshop. I fully curate those schedules. Oh, wow. I also curate our tournament schedule. Um, I oversee some of the, like, sort of the volunteer temp employee staff that we have. We call them mm -hmm. the PAX enforcers. Yep. There are, you know, hundreds They take their jobs very crew, seriously. <laughs> as they should. <laughs> So I, I am the manager for a couple departments there. So my title is tabletop manager. Okay. Because that's just our tradition for but you're the not other packs. Booking shows. vendors, you're not doing that whole thing. I, just... I assist sort of as a number two in okay. a lot of different functions. So I'm on our exhibitor sales team. Mm -hmm. I, I assist our operations team with floor plans and layouts. Okay. Essentially any job for the convention planning. I am the how to translate that into tabletop gaming speak. Wow. So I'm involved in, in every aspect of the show planning, uh, for the most part. But I, I'm not the master decision maker or planner in most of them. Interesting. I help, you know, guide the decisions so that it suits a tabletop audience, and and that's why I was brought in right. in the contract role that I have, uh, because this is a unique show. It, it really amongst is amongst the Pax brand. Right. So ostensibly, my role is Pax tabletop manager. At a normal Pax, that would be you know, a large tabletop gaming area. Here it's right. six individual departments within a larger show. I mean, right. I, I it's oversee the crew. It's not just one crew. room and yeah. one library. That's the crew that's doing RPGs, uh, the, the free play, the tournaments, the miniatures. Uh, we call it our demo team, which is runs the first look and that right. learn and play room. And we also created sort of the analog to our classic console retro video gaming area. We call it classic cardboard which is nice. this funky little room of <laughs> you know, 70s and 80s, 90s gaming. Uh, I, you need to get like the yeah. flip the table guys to go like man oh, that for you. Flip came and ran, <laughs> and ran a, a tournament <laughs> and he's, and here's spoiler, he's doing it again. Oh, there you go. We do have an announcement. So, so that's sort of where my sphere of influence within the, within the show is. I oversee those six okay. gaming departments and I assist all the other people amongst our large staff that do all these other great jobs and I help explain and you know guide them to make decisions oriented to a tabletop specific show. I think each show has its own flavor and I think eventually what you do is you find the one that fits you, fits your lifestyle, fits your family, whether it's tournament play at WBC, whether it's being on a cruise because Absolutely. nobody else in your family games and you can game while they do excursions and fun things. I think that the they're as much as we have, I still think there's even room for more because I think people just want to do this and I think it's a great reason to get away. Well, yeah, you, once you've curated your perfect board game collection, you got to actually play these things. <laughs> you know, so, that's the reason why people take vacations is it's hard to break away from the stresses and the responsibilities right. of life. So you want to take a weekend away and you sort of get to do your thing and just be yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so I'm really I'm I'm super excited yeah. for this. There's, this there's is, certainly room yeah. for growth in the convention industry. Yeah, and uh, I you know and everybody who kind of you know cried wolf last year at the BGG PAX running into the same weekend. I think it's important to note that both of them were almost at capacity anyway. So there's no shortage yeah. of people going to things. Yeah, you I know, mean, it's nice that they're not on the same weekend this year, absolutely. Like I said, we're recording PAX West weekend. There is, PAX yeah. West is going on, <laughs> Dragon Con is happening right now, uh, Fan Expo Canada yeah. in Toronto is happening. On a holiday weekend. There, I know it's there's like... a fourth convention, I, it's escaping me now. But yeah, there's four conventions going on over Labor Day weekend, you know, it's yeah. a very large half of the world we live in. 
So there, there's yep. room for everybody. Absolutely. One of the, the funny things when you said, you know, is there going to be more packs and plugs? And I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, people were asking a lot about the other packs is to say, are there still going to be board games <laughs> at PAX oh, East? Okay. PAX yeah. The question still does come up sometimes to say, you know, You're still going to have the board game room in the new is this and... going away or is it just condensing down to Philadelphia? The answer is absolutely not. I mean, it's, okay. it's certainly staying there. Like I said, we brought first look over to all the other PAXs. The fact that we have this show only helps us do a better job at right. all the other PAXs because this is our, like a test lab nah. for great ideas and things we can implement on a large scale. And if we really love it and all the attendees really love it, then we can try to bring that sort of content to awesome. all the other PAXs. Sounds great. I'm definitely looking forward to it. So, awesome. So, well, A, we'll be there. Um, you know, I'll be wearing my badge. I think I'm going to con Dan into going at some point. So, we'll find you at PAX Plug, but we're going to go play a quick game. And we're actually going to go, we're going to set up at a table and sit like adults, I think. I think that's going to be fun, right? No. Dan, are you ready for this? I am ready to play a game. All right. So, we'll be right back in our new game studio after this. Introducing the all-new convenient travel edition of Game All Night. Perfectly sized to fit in your phone or audio device, the Game All Night audio show is now a podcast you can take with you on the go. Featuring the witty repartee you have come to know and love from the video show, but with no distracting pretty sets or guests to get in the way of your listening enjoyment. Now you can play along in the comfort of your car, filling your ear holes with soon-to-be classic episodes and games galore. Find links, news, and episode guides at GameAllNightShow.com. Download yours today. It's game time! So... We have adjourned to the gaming area. It's casual time. Got a few drinks, bars behind us, and we're ready to play a quick round of Decrypto. Now, again, don't count on us for rules. We're just playing this to play it. If you really want to read the rules, that's what Board Game Geek's for, so check them out. And uh, I believe Dan's just going to throw us into this and see what happens. So, Dan, so, what do you got in store? So, yeah, Decrypto is a game from uh, Yellow Publishes It, uh, from... Tomas, uh, oh, what's his name? Tomas Dajane L'Esperance is uh, is the designer of the game here, um, and uh, so it's a team versus team word association game. Where the okay. idea is that we're um, spies transmitting messages, sequences of three digits back and forth to your teammates um, without them being intercepted by the other team. Um, Got it. So uh, in this version of the game, I'm going to uh, serve as everyone's teammate. I'm going to be teammate for both Chris, black team, and Matt, white team. Assuring um, that he never loses. Indeed. Dad. That's, a, that's a... See how I... When you're the oh, game master, you make sure that... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, in this, I will not be participating in the interception uh, <laughs> phase of the game because, of course, I know all of the answers. Uh, but, okay. So, for the very first round, I think the easiest way to do this is to show an example round. So, for the very first round, I'm going to give all of the clues and then we'll start alternating things a little bit. So... So quick rules moment. Dan's writing down clues because he's trying to get me to guess the correct sequence of numbers yep. based on these words that I have in front of me. Sure. Um, they have to actually be contextual clues. Like you can't give clues that refer to their like number position or to the number of letters in the word or rhyming clues. You actually have to be contextual about the word, um, All which right. is unsurprising. Okay, so we're going to do this first. Okay. So I'm going to give the white team's clues. So here's a chance now, Chris, for you to write things down because you're going to want to write these three clues down so that you know what the white team has said this round. Uh, the words are, the clues are in this order, below, Prince Henry, and Fever. I, I, I see the flaw in the plan is that we have to know what the hell you're talking about. I know what he's talking about. <laughs> At this point, what I hope is that Matt knows what I'm talking about, and you have no idea. If that is true, then I have done my job as a clue giver. Then you do your job often, and you do it well. Yes. So, Matt, you can write down the black... Oh, let's do this. Let's finish off white team, and we'll do black team. Okay. So now, you 
uh, start to think about what order, what digits I'm trying to transmit. Okay. You also think about, you know, in future rounds, you would think about that. In this round, this first round, you have no information right, to go because on. I so, have you're not no... gonna, so you're not going to do anything. So right now, Matt's just going to try to guess what sequence I'm transmitting. Round. Go so ahead I'm... and announce the sequence you think I'm sending. Okay. Should I also read off the... No, no, no definitely do not read those words because that would be a terrible <laughs> giveaway. <laughs> so just the numbers, just All the right, digits. So I believe the sequence you're trying to transmit is one, four, three. And we will reveal that the white team sequence was one, four, three. So there is no failure to, inter- to, to, to correctly transmit that message. That's a good round for the white team. Now, black team, now flip this over. Because I will tell you, and you're going to want to write this down, that the black team sequence is decrypto website police squad. Look at that. So what is your guess of your sequence, Chris? So decrypto website police squad, I believe, is the the code that should be on everybody's luggage. One, two, three. It turns out that is <laughs> the same code that I have on my luggage. So... You have correctly guessed the sequence, so successful round for both teams. So you're going to go ahead and write down one, two, three. You're going to, so you know the association of those words for the black team. Okay. And now we're into the regular rounds of the game. So, so uh, white team, what are the clues for this round? Well, the three clues I have chosen are warmth, self, and journalism. Chris. Your attempt to intercept the white team's three-digit sequence. So there's really no downside to attempting to guess. You get a no. free, you get a free shot. This Correct. There are three numbers. So that, that's ability. what's weird. Correctly sent messages aren't actually worth anything. That's the default, and the failed interceptions are also the default. You win the game by either you win the game by successfully intercepting two messages. You lose the game by failing to mm. transmit Got uh, to your own team two messages. Everything else is okay. Interesting. It's free. All right. Now, do I find out which parts are my errors, or do I just find out if it's a yay or nay? You'll eventually hear the correct sequence, that's, and that will be all you get. All right. So my guess is one, two, four. Okay. So his guess is one, two, four. My guess for your sequence is two, one, three. Correct. So the correct sequence is two, one, three. And Chris, you can write down now what you you now know what warmth, self, and journalism actually associate to, so you can write that down. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. So I will go ahead and reveal that the black team's three clues for this round are shed, monster, Gilligan's Island. Right. So, okay. So he's writing down shed, monster, so Gilligan's Island. Trying to guess steal. on fairly limited information. I believe the sequence is. Four, two, three. Four, two, three. Chris, what do you think the sequence is? One, two, four. And our answer is one, two, four. So successful. I see it's interesting because um, if you know the clues, it's kind of straightforward. I don't think that you can, I think it's not hard, but I think that's the intercept and in trying to, to suss that out that's really the key here. Indeed. And to avoid, as clue giver, to avoid being too too obvious. Because believe me, it stinks when I'm you're like, well, you're gonna pick a lot better one for that. <laughs> okay. So now we'll go ahead and switch it up. So Chris give draw for this round. I will draw for the white team okay. and write down some clues. And we'll do it again. The three clues for the uh, so, so my three gonna, clues are... I can write these down, but go ahead. Man. Cage, Shirley, and Sesame. I'm making it easy. So yeah, now man. you are going to attempt to intercept these while I actually have to guess what they really are. So go ahead and write down your interception guess. This is what's, what's weird. I'm, what's really weird is that the deeper you get, the deeper the clues get, and the more obtuse the clues can go because you can be going down a shared consciousness. I'll admit, I thought this game was going to suck. I'm kind of... So kind of pleasantly surprised that it this is right. this is the recurring theme, by the way. I have Chris is like this medium shit sounds terrible, but, but, but that was he's a ton not, of fun. He's not lying. He's like every time I'm like, I'm surprised. Like, damn, I'm surprised. That game was actually fun. No, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. 
Go ahead and oh, so so go ahead and give your interception. My interception time. attempt is one four three. Don't write that down. And I believe the correct sequence is one three two. You are correct. All right, so we'll flip that card one. over. So it's one three two. So the white team's clues are, and you can write this down, Chris. Pancake, George Carlin, realize I down whatever. Chrysler. The tiebreaker, by the way, in this game, uh, if you were to hit, like everyone were to lose in the same round or win in the same round, is to see how many of the opponent's words you can actually guess. Oh, really? So, yeah, if, we're, if, we're, if everyone. If you know ends, what? Yeah, I'm changing of, my mind. I'm erasing a number. Of, of tiebreakers, that's a good one. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. It's, it's fun to do that, even if it's not a tied game. It's fun to see how many of them, by the end the of it, words you've you sussed can... out. Like, All right, I'm ready to lock in those lyrics. All right, first interception guess. What do you think the sequence was, Chris? I think it's two, four, three. And what do you think the sequence was, Matt? <laughs> Two, four, one. Oh. <laughs> and this is 100%. My fault because the answer is no. two, four, three. <laughs> so All right. uh, I apologize so. deeply to Matt. So yes, so we have a, a successful interception and, a, and a failed transmission, both of which are probably my fault. Um, so uh, so I'm awesome at this game. <laughs> so everyone's so glad that I'm the shared teammate. Maybe I'll just do the same pain to Chris. <laughs> Alright, so now I'm gonna give clue. Yeah, you're gonna to draw you. a white card, I'm gonna draw a black card. The white clues are human <laughs> joke infomarshal. Alright, Chris, what's your attempt to intercept? Human joke infomercial. Do you have an interception attempt? My interception attempt is one four three. My guess is one four two. Your guess is correct. One four two is the answer. Hmm. Okay. Write those down, Chris, so you know for future rounds that one four two. He's on to at least. Yes. He, he's got. He's, on the he's verge picked of up the greatness. scent of a couple of these words. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right, but he did. That would have ended their game right there if we managed to intercept the second clue. So fortunately, that didn't happen. All right. So the black clues are pick Disney World chips. Chips. Meanwhile, chips. I am nowhere near close to intercepting <laughs> your messages, but we will see. Um, Which is unfortunate because I've let you down on one of my clues. What we'll the recap? What happened in round three and how I blew that? But oh well, everybody at, at home has already seen the word, so they already know <laughs> how much you let them down. How much? How bad Dan is at this game? Usually, you're supposed to rig the game for the guests, not me. Yeah, it's true. Let's switch these cards real quick. Ah, <laughs> this is tough. Got a guess though. Do we have an interception guess? My interception guess. I'm on the fence about it, but it's one four three. One four three. What is your answer, Chris? One four two. The answer is one four two. I have to say, by the way, it turns out that this round both teams' code <laughs> were was, one four two. Was one four two. <laughs> And in both cases, the interceptor guessed the one four part and missed the two. <laughs> Sorry, the one thing about I'm, I'm fussing with my phone, tweeting and doing all the fun stuff. So I apologize if okay. that actually makes sense. So it now I was the clue giver for black that time, so I'm clue giver for white. So I'll draw a white card. You'll draw a black card. And we'll do this. We'll go to the fifth round. I I kind of feel the need to do this clue. I, I'm going to apologize in advance. So, the longer you play, the more obtuse your clues get, and whether you, the other person shares that obtusity. Yeah, we're up to three different columns that have TV shows in them now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing that on purpose at this point. Yes, <laughs> really yes. Me up. I like that the uh, the code things are like little floppy five and a, no, I'm gonna. 
No, they're they're eight inch floppy disks. I think five and a quarter was the way to go, though. No, there's no notch out of the side. No, okay. That remember, like back in the day, we used to like buy. You could buy a disc notcher that you could like notch the other side of the disc, so then you could turn the disc over and use the and back get, side. Get extra. Get double the storage, storage man. In there. Double. Double. Yeah, Double. I actually think this game really, really <laughs> nails its like like eighties uh, tech theme. Yeah. Like, uh, it's a lot of fun with the with the like literally. The red I, I haven't technology. seen since I was a kid uh, red screens, and uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. All right, so I'll do white team first. I don't know. Go ahead, go ahead, Chris. You do you do black teams first. Um, so black teams' words are black teams' words are Turkish prison. Turkish prison. Okay. Camera. And Christmas. Well, Turkish prison is a dead giveaway. But <laughs> the other two. Turkish prison, camera, Christmas. Uh, you're you're trying to intercept. I'm trying to write those down. Turkish prison is clearly in the same category as Police Squad, <laughs> given the Leslie Nielsen connection. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it took a bad day to stop doing blow. <laughs> <laughs> took a bad day to stop sniffing glue. Now I need to guess number two and three here. Camera. I'm going to my guesses. Well, I'm going to just take shots in the dark here because I got nothing. Go ahead and intercept. Three, one, four. And I think it's three, four, two. It is actually three, four, two. <laughs> The three words for white are gut, sheet, foul language. I believe the code is one, two, four. Matt, what do you think the code is? I also believe the code <laughs> is one, two, four. It turns out the code is one, two, four. <laughs> well played. Ending the game with a successful interception by Chris. That was excellent. So and a rare host win for. All right. So so real quick, <laughs> what do you what do you think they are? That's the question. Well, go ahead. You, 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 you were I, on to you were on to well, white team's say. words. So what do you think? Let's start with you, Chris. Actually, what do you think the white team's words were? All right. So punch for, for one. one. One was not punched, by the way. Griddle would be two. Griddle. Interesting. No. So um, one was one was body, it turns out, and not punch. But we, we I okay. was I was stuck on a theme, so by going with gut and blow, I was yep, I was gonna, feeding into your punch. Body blow. Yeah. So I was going with body, but I was feeding into your punch. And theme, like two so. is like griddle. Or you know two, two was two was blanket. <laughs> two is blanket. Oh sheet blanket. Okay. I thought that was a little too obvious. Um, fever, journalism, Chrysler. Um, kind of put it at like um, recall. Interesting. Okay, like a interesting that you found a theme through those things. The answer was yellow. Yellow. By the way, I screwed up, Chris. I meant Chevy. I meant Chevrolet. It wouldn't yellow. have made a difference. But no. it wouldn't. I figured the car, body the was part of the body. And then the, the best one though was Prince Chevy. Henry, George Carlin, joke and foul language. I have to say comedian. Close. <laughs> Aristocrat. Aristocrat. It's the next best thing. But you went down that road to, to get there. So any any thoughts as to And by the way, the I, mis I misfired on the Aristocrats thing, so... Uh, it's Aristocats. Well, there's, there's, no. a, there's, <laughs> there's a joke called... There's, there's a, a documentary called The Aristocrats, which is about a, a particular joke that comedians tell each other. Please don't confuse it with The Aristocrats. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't, sure don't show the wrong one to your children. Because... Adventures in parenting. <laughs> right there. Um, but George Carlin features prominently Disney, in that. But that's like the it. one that was, was a missed time between us because the George Carlin angle did not work. Any thoughts? Yeah, what do you have for... Let's for see. I, I am really at a loss for most of these. Number one was decrypto, shed, cage, pick. I mean, I'll say tool. Padlock. Padlock. Mm. 
Then number two, we have website, monster, sesame, chips, and Christmas. So, oh, cookie. Ah, it is. It is. <laughs> that makes sense now. I, I did not include this. When it said website and, and monster, I was like, oh, jobs, like monster.com. You're We're going for this. Uh, police Squad, Shirley, <laughs> Turkish Prison. I'm thinking uh, satire. Airplane. Airplane. <laughs> it's, although it, it doesn't have the exclamation point. Fair so. And Gilligan's Island, Disney World, camera, I'm thinking tourism. Tourist, yeah. How did I lose? <laughs> <laughs> you had it. You had it. If only I'd stop to think. Awesome. Well, Matt, this was this was a lot of fun doing this with you. Thank you very much for bringing this, Dan. Thanks for teaching. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We uh, we went and ordered some pizza, and I think that that's about to show up. But in the meantime, Matt, where can like obviously you're going to be at PaxU. Where else can people find you? Uh, I am writing for dailyworkerplacement.com. That is my blogging retirement home. So I write you know, every <laughs> month or two. I, I get the itch to write something. I put it up there. It, it was my favorite website uh, as cool. a reader. So I wrote to them and joined on board to do some writing there. I'm working on a piece for how to live stream games right now. Just a quick and simple setup people can do. So look forward to that. All right. And, Pick uh, games that don't have yeah. a lot of quiet downtime while you're trying to guess what everybody else is playing. Yeah. That'd be a good idea. Yeah. Uh, other than that, you can just check out <laughs> Twitter, you know, at Matt Morgan MDP, and I post all sorts of interesting things there. Yeah, quite. <laughs> say that. He takes vacations occasionally and posts interesting things from that yeah. as well. Yeah. It's about one one third gaming, one third weird, one third grab bag. We appreciate the weird. So there you go. Hopefully you don't screw up the message you're trying to receive the next time you game all night. Have a good night. Well, that's a wrap. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed our efforts at comedy and fun, please support us on Pod Pledge. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, don't forget to engage with us on Board Game Geek Guild 3134. You can also check us out on our website, GameAllNightShow.com. And this show has been made possible through supporters like these. Game All Night is proud to be sponsored by Game Toppers. Check them out at GameToppersLLC.com. Upgrading your gaming experience. Angry Octopus. Sometimes being responsible is expensive. We can vamp, so when I speed this yeah, up, yeah, 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 this will be this will be cut. Um, I knew what I was doing before. That was <coughs> not sure. Whoa! Should I order pizza? Are you hungry, man? Hey, on the plus side, I can spell your name now. So there comes that time when do you tell your wife you just ordered pizza and it's going to show up and it's paid for, or do you just let her answer the door? <laughs> See how and it goes. Figure it out. <laughs> I'm really scared that there's a clerk's moment coming on the first answer. I can go in a lot of bad directions. The two you clues know. being low and south. <laughs> I, I believe clerks. <laughs>